Hello and welcome to Healthcare IT Today, where we explore the latest healthcare technology trends and discover valuable insights in health IT. I'm Colin Hung, and joining me today is one of my favorite people to interview, Dr. Adrian Boise, Chief Medical Officer at Qualtrics. Dr. Boise, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you. It's always a lot of fun to interview you. We always, I always feel we have amazing conversations, and I always learn so much when I talk to you. See, I bet you say that to everybody, Colin, but I'm going to take it as special for me. So thank you. So let, let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, what aren't we talking about when it comes to patient experience that we should be talking about in your mind, Dr. Poise? Well, there's a lot to be talking about, especially I think the intersection of how we're beginning to think about hybrid workplaces, what really gets people connected to meaning and purpose in their roles. And, you know, recently I was asked how patient expectations are changing. I don't really think they're changing. I just think maybe hopefully we're listening more and differently and organizations as they seek to differentiate are finding they need to act differently. They need to create new processes and systems to enable ease and access uh, is there so much fragmentation and pain in healthcare that we can do a better job of managing? So those are some things we should keep talking about for sure. And at, as you know, I've, I try to think about that as taking empathy from this one-on-one, -on -one, you know, uh, very difficult thing that happens between two people, whether it's your colleague or a patient, and really dialing that up into the organization. What does it look like to operationalize empathy within systems? Uh, what kind of processes, operations do systems change when they want to bake that in and to make people feel cared for? That's, you bring out something very interesting there, operationalizing empathy. What are some of the things that we could do to actually accomplish that? Yeah, well, it's one of my favorite topics, so you'll have to stop me, stop me from talking at some <laughs> point. You know, look, I, I think it always starts with, with leaders and how they show up right? Are your leaders in the work, first of all, are they making patient experience, employee experience, the human experience, an organizational priority? Does it sit on their OKRs, right? Mm -hmm. We've had this whole flurry of organizations setting OKRs and tracking performance and everybody's reading the books. It's, it's great. And it's really important to laser focus an organization on the work to be done. And experience has to be on that list. Uh, and hopefully not the 26th, but the third. And that makes it crystal clear to everybody within the organization that this matters. The second piece I think is whether or not our leaders uh, model the skills we wanna see in the world. So do we have leaders that show up and tell stories about times where they failed and they own that responsibility and they model that failure is okay as long as we're learning. Do we have leaders that tell a story about how patients have impacted them as much as they've hoped to impact their patients? Do we have leaders that do a head check with everybody on the team before they start blabbing? You know, I mean, are we being intentional about connecting as humans before we move organizations into the work to be done? I think it starts with leaders every time. Um, one example I had in the past was Mayo made reducing burnout and OKR for the organization. That, that's a huge statement to say, I'm going to dedicate time, energy, and effort to this focus. Um, so I, I think it starts there. Other things that I've seen, I see organizations uh, when they huddle on units, right? They start with a moment of caring. They read a letter from a patient as part of their process, not as a nice add-on but as a, every single meeting is gonna start this way because we're humans caring for humans first. That's the message it sends to people. Uh, other things I've seen are incorporating, uh, I heard a great example the other day at uh, Northwell where uh, people were, the surgeon was actually asking for the spouses of the patient they were going to ap operate on hmm. to send them a brief video or paragraph about the patient so that they could read it to the entire team before they start the operation. I mean, that is how you bake it into how we deliver care so it doesn't fall off 
just because that surgeon leaves or just because somebody leaves, you bake it into how we time out or how, how we huddle in the OR before doing a procedure. Um, uh, another example I can think of is uh, we use uh, tiered huddles, very popular uh, process, both at Intermountain and large healthcare systems. Uh, Cleveland Clinic uses it as well. And um, uh, um, we baked into that process a moment to read the names of every single patient who died in the organization from, from the day before. You know, that those types of not nice things one on one, those types of movements, of gestures, of operations um, where people can see how you're living out your values every day and feel connected to the purpose and mission. That's how you bake it in. And that is that that is how we move from simply an occasional effort here or there, throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall <laughs> into, into how we operate and designing it around the people we care for. Wow. I really love those examples. I mean, you're, what I'm hearing is these examples of, of physicians and clinicians and people are just taking the time to recognize that these are fellow people and yeah. community members that you are caring for. Right. And so I won't say humanize them because that's the moment, the bad term, but, Isn't it crazy? but, but, ter but turning, turning them from being a, a medical record and patient, you know, X or X number in the day to an actual person who has a family and has friends and, and hearing a little bit about them, I mean, I can see how that could definitely add uh, another layer to the care that's being provided. Yeah. And I, I think about it as not, you know, it, it is a nice thing to layer in. And I would submit to you two other points. The first point is that the clinicians themselves are humans, right? When patients ask about me, I, I've, I'm like, feel so incredibly touched. And I always think of something fun to tell them back. Like, oh, I just picked up Taekwondo or, right? So I, because if we can meet as humans, as people, we can have a very richer, deeper conversation. Um, and it sets a very different tone than just the medical facts, to your point, right? The, the eye patient or the EHR patient. And I think the other thing that happens is we care differently, right? If, if, if you're my mom, sister, brother, dear Colin, I've cared for for 20 years, uh, I behave differently in that relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and actually there's not just, am I willing to go the extra mile and be more intentional about what I'm doing, I will slow down. I will check every box twice. I will make sure that I don't harm you. Uh, and, and there's benefit to me in that, right? That we, we can heal each other there in a very different way when we create space for it. You recently wrote a, a blog <laughs> where you uh, sort of challenged uh, us in the industry to be brave, to chase joy. And you had this wonderful diagram that was in there. It was sort of a joy pie. It was like a pie chart <laughs> where you divided up joy. Can you maybe expand on that uh, for us here and, and how that relates to what we've just been talking about? Sure. Uh, well, you know, when I was transitioning roles, I kept thinking about you know, what brand new title do I need? Am I the chief transformation officer? Am I the chief design? Is it digital in my people? <laughs> Who am I? And I kept centering it around the title. Like I got to have a good title as my next thing. It was really an odd conversation in my head. And I, I kept literally going in circles. And so finally, and I was getting frustrated actually, because I thought I've got this great energy and skill set. Why is it so hard to figure out what's next? And I uh, so I literally drew a circle and um, started to to just really sketch out on there what is important. You know, I'm I won't say how old I am, but I'm approaching a milestone, and I I want to make sure that I spend the back half of my life doing work that I love and living a life that I can look back on and say, "Wow, you killed it! Right, you did the best you could with the voice that you had and and had impact and." Uh, so I started to draw out pieces of the pie based on how much time and energy I wanted to dedicate to something I felt was important to me. And that sort of changed the internal dialogue, right? From, well, what title should I have next to, to what, what really matters to me at this phase in my life? And it's not just career, right? It's life. 
And that brought some like fascinating <laughs> things that probably 20 years earlier, I may not have written down, right? I mean, obviously family was a huge component for me and also showing up in my community, taking better care of myself, like making sure I make it to exercise class or breathe fresh air every day uh, and doing work that has passion and purpose. And my, my passion and purpose is the reduction of suffering and the creation of joy. We spend so much time on the suffering and I would love to spend more time on how do we create joy in the spaces that we can. Uh, so the joy pie, I advise you all to go get one. And uh, Colin, I can't wait to see yours because it, it was just transformative for me to move out of a less constructive headspace into a much more uh, directed and grounded one. When you ask how it applies to healthcare, well, I think some of the pain that we see in healthcare today is people may not take the time to know what their joy is. Uh, and it isn't just their workplace, right? I think many healthcare, um, many people who went into healthcare, we always say, oh, they want to help people. And they want to self-care. <laughs> they want to show up in their communities. They want to be there for family. It's not this unidimensional thing. And so how could we as organizations show up to care for them in their whole lives, not just their work life? Uh, I think that's a really interesting question to expand the conversation. Um, so that's where it shows up for me. And that's how I hope it can show up for organizations to expand our definition of what is caring for people? Is it just caring for the sliver involved in healthcare and their work? Or do we want to be a place that thinks about people holistically in their, their life, their lives that they're living? Healthcare is just a small piece. You mentioned, Dr. Boise, um, having a milestone that's coming up. So let me be first to congratulate you on your 30th birthday coming up. <laughs> Congratulations on that. Oh, I love you, Colin. Uh, no, I, I, I love, again, uh, that was the Joy Pie example and, and sort of making it, um, I won't say mathematical, but we're really sitting down and understanding what parts really bring you joy and what parts you really should be focusing on. Uh, it, it was a, an interesting exercise. I haven't done it yet, but I plan to sit down and do it. And I'm going to be very interested to see do it. how the pies come out. <laughs> um, now, I want to ask you this question. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, so much has happened in healthcare. We've had the pandemic. Um, we're now dealing with the staffing crisis. Uh, there's been just so much attention being put on the healthcare system. And not all the news has been great. Um, and I think because of that and because of what's been happening with the pandemic, which is not the fault of the healthcare system, but but trust has eroded in my mind in the healthcare, in healthcare. People are just aren't as trusting as they used to be. What can we do from a patient experience um, standpoint to, to maybe rebuild some of that trust? Mm. Yeah, trust is such a, it's such a precious, fragile thing, right? Um, on both sides, patients and our own employees and people. I, you know, I recently started thinking about trust as uh, our ability in the healthcare space. Let's think about it as our ability, organization's ability to keep its promises to patients and people over time, right? To be trusted, you have to be consistent over time, meaning you can't break 18 promises day one and then fulfill them all <laughs> the next day, right? I'm not going to trust that that ground is stable. I, I trust when it's consistent over time. And th those promises that have emerged for me, um, doing a little bit of, of research around it as well to figure out what makes people, patients um, recommend an organization, for example, why would you put your own sort of uh, reputation on the line to recommend it to somebody else um, as a trusted individual? And the answers are, number one, uh, that a place works together as a team and you're a member of that team, right? <laughs> we will partner with you uh, in how we make decisions and how we deliver care. You know, we could expand on that. The second is uh, we will care for you as a person, right? So we know something about that life piece. Uh, the third is around communication, and communication in healthcare is often tied to safety, right? Serious failures in safety often result from lack of communication. And so I'm going to make two promises there. We'll keep you safe, and we will communicate effectively with you. I'm making the language up, but these mm -hmm. tenants. Um, so teamwork, empathy, communication, safety. 
And the last one I plug in there is ease. We will make it all easier. Uh, and these, in my mind, hold true for people-centered care, right? They hold true for our employees, just like they hold true for our own patients. And I think if we were able to keep those over time, uh, keep those promises, or at least reflect to people how we're trying to, right? Because we may not get it perfect every time, but if you say, I value a, you as a person, and I know you worked two shifts yesterday, so I paid for, you know, a meal for your whole family because you're also a caregiver to your mom, right? If I knew that, right, I could engage differently around it. So those would be the promises I would ask organizations to focus on to build and rebuild trust. Um, uh, maybe another plug there is the idea that um, this desire to connect with individuals, we saw it in the pandemic that some populations were harder to connect with. Not everybody wanted to get vaccinated. And so these segments of the population emerged that maybe we don't have as deep connections with as we want to. And to me, that really depends on knowing you who you are as a person, but also your values, needs, and preferences, right? Mm -hmm. If you told me that you only wanna be communicated with by phone, when I keep sending you emails, right, right, you're 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 missing the opportunity to build trust. Where you could be saying, you know what, it's really important to me to respect you as a person. You told me you only want communications on Saturday by phone from three to four. I'm respecting that, and I'm only that's why I'm calling it three thirty on a Saturday, right? That's a very different feel uh, that we can create for people. So I think if we were to springboard off some of the creativity and flexibility that platforms provided, we would amplify those promises and we would deliver on them. Where can people go to find out more information about Qualtrics? Qualtrics, well, you can call me, write me, blog me, LinkedIn me. I mean, you know, we, I just wanna hear from people. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you're adopting our product or you're, you're made up of your mind. I think I want to hear curious minds. I want to hear what your barriers are. I want to hear what your challenges are. I want to try to uh, partner with you to solve them. Uh, so, I mean, Qualtrics blog, reach out to me personally, LinkedIn me. We want to hear from you uh, in whatever capacity is, is helpful to you. It's not about us. It's actually about you and what you're trying to accomplish. So game on. <laughs> love it. Love it. Dr. Boise, it's always so amazing to talk to you. I always learn, like I said, learn so much uh, through our conversations and you shared again, so much information with us today here. Really appreciate well, it. Thanks, Colin. It's always a pleasure to connect with kindred spirits. I've always appreciated that about you. Hey, if you enjoyed this interview as much as I did, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you're listening and watching. Also, head on over to healthcareittoday.com to access free resources, industry news, and insightful articles. You can also connect with us on Twitter using the hashtag HITSM. I'm Colin Hung. Thanks for being here.